Yeah, so welcome. So we're talking about energy. And um, there's a sort of link, link to energy in this amazing building. So somebody was telling me it's the first time that the netball court here has ever been used for an event like this. Um, and haven't they done a great job? It all looks a bit like a conference center. That's great. There's a sort of irony, really, because there's a big plaque outside. And it said, with thanks to our founding sponsor, Petrocorp, 1992. Yeah? So uh, they're still in great health, Petrocorp. Petrocorp for visitors, that was the government-owned petrol company, that uh, petrol, whatever they were, corporation, uh, that has long since ceased to exist for many, many reasons. Um, but if you've enjoyed the conference, then you can come back here next month, and on the 6th of June, they have the Pink Floyd experience. Um, but fortunately, we're all mic'd up, so um, James has actually got a lovely version of Dark Side of the Moon that he was going to treat us to, and uh, we'll get through that. And unfortunately, you missed the last major event they had in this centre, uh, which was on Easter weekend, and on Easter weekend they had the 15th New Zealand Holden Nationals. So although Petrocorp isn't around anymore, there's still something going on in the provincial economy, which uh, possibly is a little inconsistent with, uh, with what we've been talking about. So we're on our journey uh, to a just transition. And yesterday, we started talking about how the transition is easy, but the justice of the transition is difficult, right? So we talked about electricity. We always talk about electricity. We talked about the Ruhr Valley, yeah, and we talked about Ratcliffe Thunder Sour, this huge coal-fired power station in the UK, coming to the ends of their lives and signaling the end of a certain period of local employment and local economic practice. And we talked about how difficult it is to make that transition uh, so you don't rip people's lives to pieces. Yeah, so that's really difficult, um, and I don't want to make life of it, light of it. And then sort of in a passing comment, we say, but it's okay because if we do the just transition, then everything will be brighter and better. But it's only brighter and better, right, if you actually build industries in the future for all these people to go and participate in. The, and, and arguably, that's harder than switching off old industries, right? Um, but we've learned a little bit about what the future holds, right? You know, so we've heard there's the digitalization of the economy is going to change everything, and that's where all the economic value is being created, and we've got flying cars, and that's absolutely awesome, and it's very exciting, and I'm sure they work. Um, I don't think anyone's got very rich out of Cora yet. Um, and the other thing we heard this morning is this is quite urgent. We need, we need to get on with this, right? And uh, that's quite hard, okay, because we are in this environment where we've got a commitment and an investment to a certain economic model. And, um, uh, you know, it would be quite nice if we could find a few examples of things that show us how it is possible to do things differently in a way that genuinely starts playing out this pathway to a low emissions economy in which society is better off, not worse off. And that was the premise behind this panel. And that's the bit where you guys are all meant to dissolve into fits of laughter, because if you Google New Zealand electricity industry in another country, you don't get the New Zealand wholesale electricity market is a masterpiece and nodal pricing is an extremely impressive piece of economic design that has endured for 25 years. You get the New Zealand electricity industry is world famous because it blacked out its largest city for six weeks and very nearly destroyed the economy. And that is the thing that we're most famous for. So I'd just like to introduce you to our panelists who are going to show you how we make this pathway to a better future. Um, but it's a long history of community engagement with the New Zealand electricity industry as well. Uh, because if you do a little bit more Googling, you'll find out that 50 years ago, so that's the year that Ratcliffe on Sour Power Station was built that we were hearing about yesterday, uh, the New Zealand electricity industry managed to galvanize 10% of its population into a community movement because 1969 was the year of Save Manapuri, yeah? And this proposal to flood so much of that part of the country with minimal community engagement was so outrageous that one in 10 people in the country signed the petition that ultimately resulted in the lake level being 30 meters lower than it was in originally intended to be. 
Yeah, so it's a fantastically constructive piece of community engagement, isn't it? Yeah, um, anyway, so it's going to be a great, it's going to be a great panel conversation. And what I really want to talk about today is what's happened since Manipuri, right? Because the industry has changed enormously. Um, and as an industry, we've done some very impressive things and we've made a hell of a lot of mistakes on the way. And there are some nuggets of experience there which are quite transferable to other parts of the economy and they're things that we need to reflect on as we look towards this electrified future. Now, before we get into this, we're going to do a bit of admin. So I'm afraid to say the conference isn't going very, very well uh, because Dr. West sitting next to me got very grumpy at the end of the last session. And um, he generalized it. He said, it's appalling, there isn't any audience interaction. What he actually went was, it's appalling. My question on Slido hasn't been answered by the person I sent it to, and I am the only person who matters in this room. Yeah. So if if you just have a little look around, right? There's 500 people in the room. Yeah. And we've got about well, I'm rambling on now. We've got about 40 minutes left for this session. So if you all have your own time on Slido, it's going to be a very superficial response that you get. The other thing you'll notice on Slido is it's got a lot of questions that have been there since yesterday, yeah? So if you look at the most rated questions, they're ones that have been there since yesterday, but it's okay, they're all for the minister and I don't have to worry about them. But if you set your filter to most recent, you can see the questions that have recently been asked. And if you're interested in this panel, you can ask a question and then you can point it at one of the panelists and then you can vote for the most recent questions and I might actually see it on my laptop, but I might not, so don't hold your hopes up. But if you don't do that, then we're not going to take any notice. No, we are, but it won't happen in this panel session. So that's how you might be able to use Slido. Anyway, enough of me. I'd just like to introduce you to, uh, to my splendid panelists. So down the end of the stage, we've got James Kilty. Yeah, so James is the um, Chief Generation and Development Officer at Contact Energy. And then to James's left is uh, Topia Ramaka, and Topia is the chief executive of the Tuwharatu Maori Trust. And Topia knows all of these turkeys, so he's going to dish out the dirt on what they're really like to work with. And then to Topia's left is Tracy Hickman, and Tracy is the executive general manager of Generation and Wholesale at Genesis Energy. And to Tracy's left is William Meek, and William's now the CFO of Mercury Energy. But one of the reasons I was so keen to have these guys on the panel rather than the chief executives is these are the guys who've actually done some really quite pioneering work in the evolution of our sector. Um, and I'd really like them to tell you some of the stories of what we've done since Manipuri um, and then give Topia an opportunity to judge us <laughs> on how well that's gone um, and have a bit of a discussion about that before we open it to the room. So, William, I wanted to start with you because Mercury's work with the Maori Land Trusts was quite pioneering. Uh, a lot of people in the room probably don't understand the context in which you and Doug did the projects uh, 15 or so years ago. So maybe just tell us, tell us, a, tell us a story, my friend. Oh, thanks, John. You're a, you'll be a hard act to follow. Um, Certainly great to be here in the, uh, in the NACI. I was here at WOMAD. Um, I was certainly not dressed like this and probably uh, quite a lot drunker, but it was a great, <laughs> a great weekend. Um, I'm the CFO at, at Mercury. I've worked in the industry for almost 25 years. I also have the pleasure of running our generation development team and have worked with uh, all the projects that the company has developed over the last uh, decade and a half. So we're very pleased to have announced uh, the Tiratia Wind Project back in March, um, the, probably the first major uh, development uh, since the Kamehi plant was completed in 2014. So it's certainly um, exciting to be back into a build phase in our sector, which has been quite quiet for some time. Uh, I really want to just step us back in terms of what happens now um, with uh, generation development, uh, particularly in the renewable space. So renewable fuel is is mostly regulated either through um, national policy statements, um, planning rules, and the Resource Management Act. Uh, no one owns the wind, no one owns the water, uh, be that in a lake, in a river, or um, in a geothermal reservoir. So those resources are secured essentially through um, an application to a regional council to effectively apply for use. 
um, typically uh, that use requires access to land. And so landowners become very, very important for both, for, well, for all power projects and that you need to negotiate access with the landowner to essentially construct the power plant. And that's where um, the geothermal journey starts for us. So uh, if we roll right back to our, company, our company's origins in 1999, um, we had the fortune of Doug Heffernan who had effectively already embarked on a, on a pretty significant engagement with uh, Maori Land Trust and Iwi in the, in the Taupo region um, at Rotokawa and at, uh, at Mokai, the geothermal plant. Um, we, had a, we, we actually bought a really small interest in a 35 megawatt power station, so that's pretty, pr pretty small, about 1% of New Zealand's electricity um, demand, um, and really started that journey um, from that point. The trust at that time was essentially, a, uh, it owned about 350 hectares of land, it had forestry and farming, um, and that was pretty much, its, uh, it, it, it eked out a pretty, uh, pretty modest existence in terms of revenue. Um, there was a great resource there, actually quite developed by um, the Crown. The Crown had actually expended quite a lot of money in exploration on Rotokawa over about a course of 30, 30 years. So there were some wells there and we could see um, the field was very productive. Um, John really asked me to say, let's, let's not just focus on the positive, it focuses on some of the challenges that needed to be overcome to actually deliver what turned out to be very significant developments. To put it into context, over a 10 year period, Mercury invested $1.1 billion into three geothermal power stations across New Zealand. Uh, Nawa Parua, which is a 140 megawatt power station at Rotokawa, um, so it's the biggest uh, single shaft geothermal plant on the planet, um, is valued today at around, let's say, round number seven, eight hundred million dollars. Um, the Tahara North Number Two Trust, who are the landowners there, they currently own 35% of that power station. Um, and I'll take you through some of the things that we needed to do for them to actually realise um, that dream of development and effectively taking control of their future and ultimately looking after um, their beneficiaries, their whanau, um, their hapu and, and any iwi ultimately. And so that's a huge success story. I won't, um, I, I, I won't put words into their mouth, but certainly the, the, in the 20 years that I have worked with uh, the trust, um, seen significant benefits for them in terms of taking the, um, the, the fruits of that power station and deploying that into uh, the, the Taupo region in terms of education benefits, health, um, really moving their, uh, their, their trust forward in terms of their well-being um, and, and place, in, place in the world. Um, challenges, so you might imagine we're, a, we're currently about a six and a half billion dollar enterprise value company and we're effectively negotiating a 100 year fuel contract uh, with, with, with effectively a land trust at the moment that essentially probably has revenue in the hundreds of thousands per year. Um, that's quite a significant challenge in terms of actually balancing the um, capabilities between what the resources we have as a large corporate in New Zealand and what they have as a small trust. So this is before you really saw the emergence of a, of a very strong Maori economy now where you had well-resourced um, entities, um, uh, well advised and certainly um, working with the trust for them to effectively get good advice. Now we're not, when you're dealing with a hundred year investment, you don't want the guy with the white sneakers turning up selling you the used Toyota Corolla. Um, you know, this is an enduring JV and we want that to be successful. So certainly, you know, working with them, actually providing them the resources so that they actually could get good advice so that their trust could make good decisions for the future. Um, when you put yourself in the, in the shoes of Māori, the, the two things they will be most concerned about as, as, a, as a trust will be the people. What's this mean for my, for my people? Their time frame for investment is very different to a corporate. They will look at things and say, what, how will my mukapuna, which is my grandchildren, judge my decisions today? They have a very, very long um, view of the future, which can be very different to the tyranny that we face in terms of quarterly earnings reports and those types of things, albeit we're making very significant infrastructure investments. So, you know, managing that long time frame. Patience is a big, you need a lot of patience to deal with the Maori economy. They actually run at different speeds to, to our businesses. Um, so spending time in the marae, you know, eating with them, doing the dishes with them, building those relationships. So, you know, embracing the differences between um, what we are as a corporate um, and what their values are as Māori is, is hugely important. So, you know, building mutual respect, um, understanding your differences and then building trust so that those relationships can endure. So those JV now is effectively run a 20 year course. Um, 
I've, I myself have seen um, transitions on the trust side for different chairs. Um, we've, we've seen people on our side um, change too, so managing that relationship at a, both a, a, a wide relationship and, um, and a deep relationship so that you can deal with the changing, uh, the changes of the guard on both sides when you have an enduring um, long-term arrangement. So you know, it's been particularly, particularly exciting. Thinking about some other things, um, uh, what's, what's another good example? Um, balance sheets. How do, you, how do you deal with the balance sheet challenges? So you're sitting there saying, how do I allocate, how do I share the risk between you as a landowner receiving some royalties um, and, and me as an owner? So where, where's the risk going here? Um, one thing we decided was that we, potentially equity would be the thing that would align incentives the strongest over time. So they would effectively face the same incentives we did as an owner in the plant um, in terms of the return. So providing them an arrangement where royalties could be effectively securitized through financing arrangements with banks and therefore put back into the power station in regard to uh, equity, I think has been a huge issue. So we sit there now, you've got a formal environment where every month you meet, um, you talk about the performance of the field, um, you can talk about the field's health, sustainability is a huge issue with, the, with geothermal reservoirs, you want to make sure that the longevity of the field is maintained, the power station will continue to operate at full capacity, um, and certainly for Māori, the, uh, you know, the resources of Honga is something they are very concerned about, and that the sustainability continues on, and it's available for future generations. So, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a pretty significant relationship with, you know, well over a billion dollars of assets where the Māori economy had now has, um, you know, significant role to play at both Rotokawa and Mopa. And, 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 and it's exciting in the context of this conversation, I think, William, because, you know, these are projects that wouldn't have gone ahead if the two of you hadn't been able to find a way through. You know, you didn't have access to the land, you didn't have access to the resources, they didn't have access to the geothermal engineering, the balance sheets, etc., etc. But of course, one of the challenges for our industry, I think, is, you know, we didn't start with a blank sheet of paper when you guys were all corporatized. You know, the old electricity corporation created a bunch of um, assets, very much in the model of Manapuri, you know, make a centralized decision and then just flatten the earth trying to, to implement it. And Tracy, obviously, you are the custodian of several of these key assets also in the, in the central North Island. What, 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 what's your journey been like as you've sort of ev evolved this uh, relationship with the, uh, with the people who actually live in and around the, uh, the assets? Thanks, John. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, look, the last day or, uh, day or two I've listened a lot uh, to general consensus that engagement and well, like genuine engagement and collaboration is going to be required and will be a key uh, element of us achieving a just transition and I think there's no disagreement in the room for that. Um, I guess the question is how do we do it meaningfully and how do we do it successfully and I think that's why John's got us here uh, because um, across this SOPA we've been engaged in this for the last 25 years and my personal career journey started actually involved in our environmental team at Genesis actually reconsenting some of our large existing hydro power schemes in the central North Island. Um, and there's lots of lessons that we can learn, and like many things in our lives, when we look back 25 years, uh, we look back sometimes, whether it's the haircuts we had, or the fashion that we wore, or our own behaviours as teenagers, we look back with a little bit of uh, horror, um, uh, probably embarrassment, and in many cases, uh, a bit of disgrace, and I think all of us on the sofa will look back. Uh, we've learned some of these lessons in a very hard way, and I'm um, very happy to share some of that, because because I think um, if it provides any learnings and any lessons and any inspiration to all of you in this room and all of those that need to be on this journey to support a true just transition, then uh, learnings from the past are really helpful. So I guess the first thing that we learnt from is that when you are thrust at the table through an, uh, something or somebody else's agenda, which back in the early 1990s was the introduction of the Resource Management Act. And the Resource Management Act required that probably for the first time the power companies actually engage with community, and in particular with Māori. And remember, many of these power schemes that we'd been built had been built many decades before under a very different regime where consultation was just not a thing. And they'd been built with a lot of opposition, but no voice from the people impacted. So for the first time, the Resource Management Act brought those parties together, but it brought them together under a construct that wasn't owned by those parties. Um, and if I'm really honest, and I'm sure there's different views along these sofas, but um, if I look back, I think 
some of the power companies, and not in every case, and perhaps I'm being extreme to make the point, we sat there because the uh, legislation required that we did, and in many cases we thought about consultation as a box that needed to be ticked, and potentially as Māori and other um, and community groups, as uh, parties that needed to be placated or kind of made to go away in order to ensure we didn't have any opposition so that we could get our resource consents through and kind of continue on operating um, without any hassles. Now I'm kind of being extreme, but actually that was the kind of mentality that we had 25 years ago. And I'm really pleased to say we've moved a long way from there, but actually we're still on that journey as an industry um, because it's actually quite hard. And I guess there's a number of things that we need to confront. And there's been lots of talk in this room in the last day and a half or so too about different perspectives. William's already touched on the fact that the corporate world has a particular way of thinking and doing business. Um, and this morning we heard about the fact that we actually need to really confront that and to think about it differently. We're starting to, but we've got a ways to go. So we think about things, you know, three years ahead for us is kind of a long way forward. In fact, sometimes we don't even know what we're doing next year, and that's exciting about this industry, it's so dynamic. But when we meet with Māori in particular, uh, and if I just call out um, an experience I had with Ngāti Bangi um, in the central North Island where uh, our Tangariro power scheme sits within their rohi, they have a thousand year vision. Um, now it's a thousand year vision that is actually aspirational, it's meaningful, like it, I can relate to it, but actually it translates to an annual business plan, incredibly useful, but you put that alongside a power company struggling to think a year or two ahead, and how do you bring those two things together? Likewise, um, I guess the question about bringing Western science together with Māori knowledge um, or Mā Tauranga. And, uh, you know, that continues to be a really big challenge because Western science breaks things up into its individual elements. It might put them together in terms of the sum of the parts. As you all know, the Māori world is very holistic. And that's been quite a challenge. And at times it's caused clashes, it's caused conflicts, and it's caused us, into the, it's caused us to actually head into the courts uh, in quite a destructive process. And I think if we look back, and we now are starting to think about that genuinely, uh, spend time together in the room. And as William talked about, the time in the room before you're forced together through someone else's agenda, actually getting to know each other, lots of time being together, bringing your whole self, not as a plastic corporate, but as an individual with your own style and personality uh, and sense of integrity and just being and listening really hard too in the corporate world where you've got so many priorities pulling you backwards and forwards. Um, and so what we have found and continue to find that the more time we spend in engagement with Māori and with other community groups, the more value we get out of those relationships. With all of that, I guess I, in my own mind, kind of explain that, is that true engagement is a currency, it's not a cost. In the corporate world, if you add up the time and you put a monetary value around it, you know, you can think about it as a cost. And in my view, if you think about it as a currency, uh, it's an opportunity cost if you don't do it. It's a currency where working through those differences, bringing together different worlds and actually knitting them together they usually don't conflict. They actually use, as we often find, they actually create uh, diversity of thought, creates far more robust and sustainable decisions. And so we're learning that through often the hard times. We're still not as good as, it, as, as we need to be. Uh, but in the last 25 years, I think we've come a long way. Uh, 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 as a journey. But of course, the, these guys are really good at this end of the sofa. <laughs> but at the other end of the sofa. <laughs> so James, we, th I mean, they're, they're sort of sugaring this a little bit. You know, there's been a couple of hints that, you know, it's, it, it's not a totally easy journey. Um, I mean, you again, you've been involved in some wonderful projects which yep. uh, have had a diversity of partners. What, what's Compact's journey been like and what are your personal reflections on this story that they're spinning us? Well, uh, I, I think we've made um, pretty much every, well, I'm sure there's more mistakes we'll make, but we've made a um, great many mistakes. Um, uh, I can think of many, many occasions where I have turned up and said, done um, exactly the opposite, exactly the wrong thing. And then I, ha I went through a period where I thought I had an extraordinary gift, actually, for turning up and saying the wrong thing. <laughs> um, all with good intent. 
or with authentic good intent find um, a, a path forward with various um, stakeholders, be the Māori or community, but always with my foot firmly in my mouth. Um, uh, often with my big toe sticking out, the amount of times I've turned up at Marae, whipped my shoes off and gone, oh no, I didn't put on decent socks, <laughs> toes sticking out. Um, <laughs> so you know, our journey uh, at Contact has been um, one of constant learning um, and we have learned a great deal more from uh, our engagements with uh, communities than we have um, uh, taught, I think, uh, to be blunt. Um, you know, looking forward, for us as a country and the opportunity to transition our economy in a just way, we all know there's going to have to be more engagement and better engagement and collaboration. But it has to be with purpose. It has to be driven by an authentic, meaningful purpose to create more value for everybody in the room. If you're there box ticking, you know, we've been, as an industry, we've been through that phase you're done, you're gonna get nowhere going forward. Our just transition will fail, if that is the, um, uh, the attitude we take. So you have to be there to create value and you have to be there to share value. And you have to be there authentically. And what I have found um, is that notwithstanding all of the huge number of mistakes I've made, um, as long as I've fronted up to them and apologized, um, because most of it's, it's ignorance, not arrogance, it's just ignorance, um, I have found a great deal of um, forgiveness and a great deal of willingness to share um, perspectives. Um, and from that, you can create a genuine uh, shared purpose. Um, I mean, we've had, I guess, one, a couple of examples. But one we've seen go full arc. We explored a geothermal resource with a, a Māori partner, and we spent a long time talking about the purpose of uh, of us working together on that. Explored the resource, everybody um, uh, said they would do certain things and everybody did them. Um, it was a great partnership, it remains a fantastic relationship, but it's no longer a business partnership because uh, upon expiration, the value wasn't there. And so we had in the, what's the, what's the term? A, a conscious uncoupling or something? <laughs> so we had a relationship go, full arc like that. Now the relationship is very strong, it remains very strong because the relationship's personal. And I'm still connected very much with those people at a personal level. Our business partnership, for now at least, has come to an end. We started with very honest conversation, we made promises to each other, we lived those promises, it didn't work, the business proposition, the value creation that we were hoping for and aiming for wasn't there, and so we've uh, gone our separate ways at a business level but not as a, at a relationship uh, level. Um, the only other story I'd say very, uh, very quickly, um, uh, looking at the time, is upon the creation of Contact Energy in the late 90s, um, we inherited a certain set of relationships based on all those behaviors of the past that um, Tracy and William have, have both mentioned and John has poked the stick at us about. Um, and for the first 10 to 15 years of our existence, we did not do a very good job at all of improving those and then slowly began to listen and learn and we're still listening and learning today. Um, one in particular uh, was particularly challenging um, and that was a relationship we had uh, at the Ohaki Geothermal Power Station. Um, uh, and it just had decades, literally decades of, of very real um, uh, disagreement, anger, uh, disempowerment, uh, frustration and all of those, uh, all of those things. Um, and over a period of sort of 10 years and with some change on our side, we made some changes on, on our side, um, a different group of people came together uh, and found a way to talk together. Um, and out of that, um, we have connected into those people a, uh, a, a business that is uh, now developing that resource in a different way than we do. Uh, they're utilizing, a, the extracting a mineral silica from uh, the resource. That is creating for the first time in, in generations employment opportunities in that area. And that business is moving from an R&D phase, really cool business, R&D, and into a genuine development and growth phase uh, on that field. And that can, I don't think that would have been possible 10 or 15 years ago. It became possible 
because um, a different group of people got involved and built trust. Um, and the trust between those individuals remains very strong. I still think um, at a, a company level um, that the trust is strong at an individual level, but perhaps not yet firm at an organisational level, to be honest. I think we're still viewed as a, a big corporate um, uh, and, and everything, all the negative implications that go with that by many people uh, in that area. That's not our intent, but it is the perspective of, of those stakeholders. So um, I guess those are the comments yeah, no, I've made. Th th thanks, there. James. And they're, they're lovely, and they're, these are specific examples. I mean, you know, it's, it's very easy to talk in generality, but these are, these are big projects that create genuine benefit for a wider society. The electricity powers the New Zealand economy. This money is going into communities, um, uh, and these things wouldn't be happening without this sort of participation. And Topia, when we were preparing for this, Tracy said rather poetically, it would be really great if we could try and tell the story of the transition from stakeholder to partner, but I don't know whether we can do that. Um, the nice humility about it. But, I mean, you, you work with all three of these guys, right? You know, um, Tuparatoa, you know, you, you are the <laughs> you're there, and, and you know, you've know you had positive and negative experiences with them. What, what's your reaction to hearing, hearing this? Is this just puffery, or do you think there is something going on, or some home truths you'd like to deliver to your groups? <laughs> oh, well, kia ora tātou. Tuatai tēnei te mihi ki te hau kāinga o Tarana ki maunga, me ngā i o ngā haue whakai nō i roto i te parirau o tēnei whare, mauri ora kia tātou katoa. Just really acknowledging Tarana ki iwi for the welcome and the nākitanga over the last couple of days, and I also acknowledge everyone in the room. I hail from the centre of the universe, Taupo, uh, centre of the North Island, anyhow. Um, where I come from, uh, oil, fresh water is our oil. Uh, geothermal is our gas. So uh, over the last couple of days, I've been listening to some of the more uh, regional issues um, in this region, and I acknowledge those, and those are specifically unique to this um, rohe. And it's, it's quite right that the, that the home people um, are the... Are the persons quite rightly placed to address those, as it is in each one of our areas. So I'll, I certainly will speak from um, my experiences uh, and our experiences in terms of the Central North Island that is, that is Tuwharatoa. Um, I just want to acknowledge also the relationship that uh, Tuwharatoa has with uh, Mercury, Genesis and Contact. Uh, we have long established relationships and they are in many shapes and forms. Some are more commercial in nature, uh, some are more um, uh, based on RMA instruments. Uh, but I certainly want to acknowledge uh, the organisations, and I want to acknowledge the, the truth of, the, uh, of, the, of, of my friends here, who, in the honesty in which that they've, they've discussed the issues today. I actually think that there's uh, uh, everything that they've said I, I absolutely agree with. Um, but to go a little bit further, and although I'll speak from first-hand experience, I'm going to generalise also. Um, and it's, it's been touched on, uh, but it's important to, I think, understand from our perspective, and it may be a pan Māori perspective, um, the history and context in which uh, we have experienced, the experience with the energy sector. And for us, it didn't start at the breaking up of the ECNZ structure. It actually started uh, well before that. For us, it started in the 1920s, when the government came to town and confiscated Lake Taupo. Uh, for the purposes of uh, hydro generation. So that was an immediate issue, uh, and clearly it's an e it, was an e it was an area of concern for us. Um, putting that aside, over the next 50, 70 years, uh, assets were developed uh, on, our, on our taonga, on our resources, and um, <clears throat> that was very much a very a relationship based on hurt, uh, a, a relationship based on mamai, uh, and all these different things that our old people uh, had to contend with. Then comes the RMA, and uh, the words avoid, remedy, mitigate. And uh, 
one of the first jobs, and I acknowledge Tracy and, um, and others, the first job, uh, cab, first cab off the ranks was specifically Genesis and Mercury and then later Contact, reconsenting these significant assets in the central North Island. And, uh, and I acknowledge Tracy for her comments around having to do the job to get a consent or permit to allow for the free operation of a uh, power station for the you know, efficient running of a uh, company or SOE. Um, it was a, that was a trying time in itself. And what we experienced was that our relationships at the end, the outcome was a mitigation type arrangement. Um, and that is uh, one where both parties out of no really desire of their own to uh, cohabitate together, um, decided to reach an agreement to allow for the free operation of these assets. Parking issues that we probably didn't want them there in the first place. Uh, there have been some really successful uh, um, outliers to that, and I acknowledge William and uh, organisations like Tuarapaki, Tauhara North 2 and others who have managed uh, by themselves to create a successful commercial organisation and partnership with these organisations. But generally speaking, uh, those are few and far between. Uh, Māori generally were disenfranchised via legislation, whether it be Crown Minerals Act, uh, 27B memorials, uh, legislation concerning um, uh, natural resources generally, uh, where the playing field was tipped against us. And so it was those few that managed to have land owning and full rights to their geothermal resource, for example, or, our, or other things, that were managed to combine their access with the resources and expertise of the likes of Mercury and, and others. Uh, but in saying that, it's a very few and far between. Uh, I would say generally across the country, uh, iwi, Māori, we're stuck in a, uh, uh, a relationship based under the RMA. And that's one where uh, you're forced into consult, you know, you don't have to consult, but generally uh, a good company does. And there are outcomes that fall out of that. Um, that's just how it is at the moment. And unless the government is brave enough to challenge some of the uh, challenges of, you know, the the legislation that uh, that may unlock the p further potential of Māori to engage at an a equal footing with these um, big corporates, then the question is, well, how might we uh, engage ourselves between an, you know these corporates and iwi generally? And that's the discussion I'm in because I don't think I don't see any priority from this government at the moment to level any of that playing field. So the challenge I have for the chairs and the board directors and the senior leadership team of uh, all of our corporates uh, is how do you wish to engage with Māori um, to ensure that you're contributing in such a way that you bring some aroha to the hopes and aspirations that those iwi have? How many of us grab hold of the strategic plans of iwi and think, well, yes, we have a uh, RMA-type relationship over here, but how else can I, how can I choose to contribute to the well-being of your people? Because generally speaking, these assets are in communities and regions where uh, our, you know, our people reside. And um, it makes sense for a whole bunch of reasons that you contribute to that. And that's the, that's the, that's the discussion I'm interested in, and that's the challenge I have um, for us all to think about. Yeah. And James, you, you were saying, you gave a nice example of where, you know, from a not exactly the best starting point, you mm. tried to develop some initiatives which eventually failed because the economics didn't work, yep. but at least you have some relationships there. I think if I hear you right, Tokyo, you're saying the backstory here is so challenging that it's very, very difficult to achieve that level of trust working collaborative. I think ye yesterday several of the speakers talked about the, the problems with consultation, that consultation just feels like somebody's already made a decision and they turn up and I think that's your box ticking thing, Tracy. But do you have any thoughts? I mean, there's an urgency around this, which we've talked about today, but it takes a long time to try and deal with these 
sort of legacy issues of the past. And as you say, I mean, this, you know, th these are deep, deep problems. It's not just a sort of a sign a check and, you know, sort of move on type of thing. You know, trust is, is, is at the heart of everything. Jones, do you have any thoughts about sort of the challenge that Toffee has thrown at the three of you? I'll get to the two of you in a sec, so he's not on his own. Uh, um, first thing I'd say is uh, that project I described earlier, the economics worked well. The economics is a social science. The financials didn't work. But as a, as a general, you know, as a, the economics were great. As a partnership, it worked beautifully and the relationship remained strong. If you think of economics in its broadest possible sense, financials didn't work, so no further investment from either party was, uh, was sensible. Um, I th think Thorpe has summed it up very well, and I think that's both the challenge and the opportunity for um, New Zealand uh, going forward. At, where there has to be a different mindset, and the reason I called you out on the difference between economics and financials is because I think that's part of the answer, right? Economics is a social science, um, uh, and too often it's used purely to describe the financial outcomes. So when we think about economics, we have to, I think, think about broader value creation. Um, I wasn't here for the session this morning on donut econ economics, but I have read a bit about that and watched the, the TED talk. Um, and that's a really interesting concept to think about how you create value and how, um, and how you think about what value is. Um, and we're seeing in our, and one last comment, um, we're seeing in our investment community around the world, as a listed company, we have uh, investors from around the world, a growing interest in what they call ESG um, investment. So um, that's looking at the environmental, social and governance arrangements of your business. And we are ranked by funds around the globe and they choose whether to invest in us or not to a significant degree based on our behavior. So I think the, the nature of the capital markets is starting to change slowly and that will drive, that will support the drive in a, in a shift of mindset and investment. So William, Top here sort of said, well, you know, these are nice stories you're telling us, like your Rotokawa stuff, but they're few and far between. Um, so does that mean that you just sort of give up and only work with resources, which is where the governance and ownership is so nice and tidy that you can actually agree to do stuff together, or are you more optimistic about the, uh, the, the future? Oh, I'm always optimistic about the future. Um, I think the future is going to be awesome. But, um, I think Topia is absolutely correct is that the that uh, we can't ignore the legal frameworks um, that impose obligations on parties to do things and and certainly there is a huge clash between um, Western structures Western laws and the way particularly Maori think about things I mean I, I think about uh, the land trust we deal with a trust is a it's a very Western concept where you essentially have a group of people, which some, in some ways was just, you just happen to be in that tent. Um, the lines are somewhat arbitrary. Um, they therefore then um, assume legal obligations to their owners or beneficiaries. Um, they, also def they also want to do things for their iwi. That becomes challenging now because they're inside this framework and you've got fiduciary obligations. Um, you know, the, 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 the grievances of, of, uh, of Māori around past developments can't be ignored in the treaty and those, and those issues. Yeah. You know, for certainly uh, for, for, for Genesis and, and Mercury as majority crown owned companies, you know, we're, we're acutely aware that when you engage, that these grievances are there, but, that, but they're fundamentally still with the crown. We can help. There are things we can do to help, but to solve that actually is something that's not within our control. But certainly spending the time, having the discussions, and there's a, there's a lot of um, people feel better after they get stuff off their chest. And we've got a very recent example. We, we had a community consultation meeting on Wednesday in Palmerston North for our new wind farm. And we had people attending that were upset who had bought property in the area and didn't know that there was a big wind farm consented behind them. And so they were like, what's that about? And so again, the legal construct is, well, it's not on your limb, it's not ob there's no obligation to do that. Um, we were a challenge because we're essentially trying to deliver a project sort of under some secrecy, 
um, because of the competitive effects, but certainly hereafter, you're engaging very heavily with those communities to say, well, this is what we're doing, these will be the effects, these are the things we're trying to do to mitigate it, but you can't make everyone happy. I mean, a year or so ago, Topia and I were in environment court, and we were on different sites. I see him today outside. Hey, Topia, Hongi, how you going? It's all good. You know, and that's, you don't always agree. Yeah. And you won't always agree. Um, but that doesn't mean that the relationship ends. You carry forward and then, you know, it's the start of the next negotiation. Um, and I think it's the journey that matters. Um, and, and so if we look at, at, at the future, and I think maybe talking specifically about electricity now. So people have been slightly beating around the bush in the last couple of days. So, you know, it's a really cute solution to the energy emissions problem is you just electrify everything. Um, it's great for these guys. Um, but that, that's an awful lot of new generation coming into the system. Plus, we have an awful lot of generation assets that are aging. Um, and it's not just a question of replacing light with light because some of the assets that are aging are um, thermal plants. And of course, the plan is that we won't be replacing them with plant that um, uh, create emissions. So Tracy, I mean, you're right in the middle of this one. You know, Genesis own the Huntley Power Station. This is the single most concentrated source of emissions in the entire electricity system. And then Topia has just said, but, you know, you've plotted your copybook as an industry in the last sort of 100 years, so that's not going to be all that easy, is it? So w what's your thought about how we step through the journey? Do we just burn more coal and stick our fingers in our ears and hope it's going to go away? Or? Uh, I hope absolutely not. Um, so we're well on the journey of trying to find alternatives to coal, and I've actually made commitments around uh, getting out of coal as quickly as we can, uh, accepting that this is a, a New Zealand challenge, it's all of our challenge, and um, certainly given some of the constraints around coal, we're going to have, around gas at times, we're going to have to be quite innovative about it. So I think we're well on that journey, and I think um, for me, you know, 25 years, not years on, I think this brings an amazing opportunity. So it's going to take innovation, it's going to take parties coming together. We've talked about the fact that we're well beyond power companies coming out to communities with proposals. We don't always have them. We have some great ones, and in fact, we're not too far from uh, announcing, and uh, we've talked already about it, but watch this space for the announcement of a big new wind farm um, in this area in the next little while, which we're very excited about, alongside our partners at Tilt. Um, so we're definitely going hard to, um, to move away from uh, the use of fossil fuels as soon as we can, but actually getting to that last uh, you know, tip of the mountain, we're already at 85%, how do we get to 90%, how do we get to 95%, how do we get to 100% um, in all hydrological and weather-related conditions, that's our challenge. Now, I think this is where community and business have this unique opportunity, and I think with Māori 25 years on, you know, when we first sat down under an RMA construct, Māori weren't ready to be there, it wasn't their construct, uh, they had treaty issues unresolved, um, they were often working through their own kind of, you know, uh, Western-based tribal structures that had been imposed on them. Um, they didn't have capital. I look now, Māori are commercial partners. They're credible, they're wealthy, they're highly organised, they've got skills and capability. Um, if we can take the time to sit in a room, share aspirations, share knowledge, share ideas, then I think we can collectively, collectively unlock those opportunities. Not because we have to, because at the time we need resource consents, we need everybody to agree, but actually because we can find these opportunities, as Mercury are able to do around Tirapaki, but there's lots more of those, and I think that's our opportunity now to actually take the time before any other constructs requiring us to, to sit in a room and unlock those ideas. Yeah, that, that, that's great, and it's growing the pie rather than just arguing over the division of the pie. I mean, I think in this context, that's, that's James Shaw's challenge, isn't it? The biggest single economic opportunity of the last however many years it was. And I, and I think that that was the, where I wanted to sort of draw this in, into the room. I mean, cl clearly the Maori economy is an amazingly important sort of part of this conversation. But there are other communities, and we've talked about, you know, the opportunities to engage other communities with energy transformation as well. Um, so, Topia, I don't know if you have any reflections from your experience for other non-Maori communities who are trying to get energy projects away and, you know, the sort of things. Because, again, a, a lot of communities, you know, they're highly dispersed and there's no sort of single point of contact. And, you know, 
big corporate dude turns <laughs> up and they just want to talk to one person. And it's hard, right? You know, mm. it's a complexity and it's just easier to let the deal die and nothing happens. Um, so what, what would your reflections there be? I think there's a, um, my experience is um, all, you know, uh, the different companies involved in, 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 in the energy space anyway, They've all got their different approaches and style and, and, and the culture and the, which the, the way in which they engage with, with, with the communities. Uh, I can only speak for um, the communities of Taupo and Tūrangi and, and the Central North Island. And um, generally speaking, out, out, out at a community level, the engagement is uh, positive. Uh, I think there is still room for improvements in that space to really, um, for uh, industry, to support the community in long-term aspirational um, outcomes. Uh, we haven't quite, quite cracked it in our district, uh, but that's a leadership issue across the board. Uh, that's an area that we need to work on. Um, but I, I think, generally speaking, I'm, um, I'm not too familiar with how industry engages in other areas, but certainly for ours, uh, I think it, it's positive. Uh, I think there is room for uh, collaboration uh, between, um, say, these organisations, these three here, Pontac, Mercury, Genesis, they all operate within a few kilometres of each other. Um, and there is a level of competition, and I understand that. But there is, I think, potential room, if there is a shared goal and aspiration, for them to combine uh, uh, resources to, to support the community and, and, and a greater outcome. Uh, we haven't quite cracked that yet, uh, but that's probably something that a, a successful organisation into the future should be looking at. And the last thing is really around um, on, on the just transitions generally. I guess my thoughts over the last couple of days is ensuring is that you know, it's all great and well to be thinking about this and, uh, and so on, but I think in doing so we need to ensure that we don't leave anyone behind. And uh, I'm talking about some of our social indicators, and I acknowledge the, the, the presentation earlier this morning around some of those social well-being indicators across the board. I think industry need to be very mindful of those because those are our workforce, that's our future workforce, uh, those are our tamariki, and um, those are all part of the big picture. And I think if boards can include that somehow in terms of their framework of thinking, uh, so you're looking beyond um, the, the balance sheet bottom line to a quadruple bottom line, including social economic, environmental, and well-being factors. Uh, I'd be interested to see where that goes. Great way to leave it. We're out of time. We could go on for hours. But ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists for being so <laughs> candid.